Hello, so really excited to be able to introduce Alrina Van Zyl, who is an amazing public health physiotherapist and women's health expert today to come in and answer some of your questions that have come in. So without further ado, Alrina, I will hand over to you, please. Right, so Linda's still in the habit of calling me by my Oh, sorry, Previous I'm name. Victorious. <laughs> sorry, yes, I am. As, as am I, I've just, I've just had a few things come back that I did last week and my vet is still in my old name. So I'm still getting used to Arena Pretorius, gone from one Dutch name to a very Flemish name. So there we go. Um, but it's still, I'm still the same person, hopefully. <laughs> um, so Linda said that there were two questions that came in so far, both um, were about uh, leaking, urinary leakage. Um, and it sounded like both were stress incontinence. Is that right, Linda? Not just urge incontinence. Um, no, I think one of them is uh, more of an urgency, urgency issue. Yes. Okay. And okay, so um, potentially address... one of them is um, prolapse orientated. Okay. So um, one of the things that I, I often caution my, my female patients, and, and, and these are the lucky ones that are actually getting help for incontinence because so many women just don't go, you know, they think they've had babies, this is normal, my mom said she started leaking, um, or they think it'll get better by itself, because sometimes after that first baby, you have a bit of incontinence and it clears up, um, and then you have the second one and it doesn't clear up, and you think, oh, it will, it will, but you're busy with two kids or three kids or whatever, um, so, you know, it doesn't really become front of mind, um, but I've yet to see really incontinence that clears up by itself. It gets worse as you get older because your estrogen is going to decline, your tissues are going to become more atrophied, your muscles are not going to be quite as strong, and it will get worse. Unless you do anything about it, it will get worse. So the traditional way of treating incontinence would be Kegels, and they're appropriate for a huge percentage of women, um, just doing your pelvic floor exercises. Again, most of my patients when in the pre-screen, I do I ask, um, are you doing them and are you doing them correctly? So often the answer will be, yes, I'm doing them, but no, I'm not sure if I'm doing them correctly. Um, and, and the overwhelming majority of women is I don't do them because I don't think I'm doing them correctly. So why would you do an exercise if you're not sure you're doing them right? And nobody's ever teaching you to do this stuff at school or, and then there's this assumption that you should know what to do, um, mm. which is so sad because then people feel like they're too, um, too embarrassed to ask, you know, how do you do them? Or, um, you know, and even when you watch a you know, video on how to do them, it's not quite the same as actually somebody being in there and actually having a feel, or even yourself being in there and having a feel, does it feel the same both sides? Because often the pelvis can be slightly twisted, particularly post-birth, or you have a slight leg length difference, or, you know, tension in your back or whatever, other tension patterns. So um, I think that's the first question to kind of answer, you know, are Kegels the solution to incontinence? And in some cases, absolutely yes, if they're done correctly. But then again, I would add in there, are you doing them in the position you're leaking? because very often people will do them sitting in the car, waiting at school, but they only ever leak when they run. So they don't do them standing up or they don't do them standing up on one bent knee. So mm. that's the position in which they're most vulnerable, um, but they don't actually test the pelvic floor, train the pelvic floor in that position. So the takeaway for today would be to, if you are doing them and you are checking that you're doing them correctly, which I'll quickly run through, um, make sure you're doing them in different positions. You know, make sure you're doing the contraction on the out breath because there's a huge relationship between the diaphragm and the pelvic floor um, in, in how things contract from a, from a bite integrity point of view, which means how the fascia is connected and the connective tissue is connected. Um, does that all still make sense so far, Linda? It, it does to me, yes. I think it's, it's um, worth just looping back on and just accentuating that relationship on you know on the out breath and why that works and also what okay. would you say to women who are like but hang on a second literally from the tummy button down I can't really feel anything so how do yeah, I that's often the case the especially with c-sections actually so my patients with c-sections that have had a traumatic birth especially an emergency c-section and any c-section is traumatic and most births are fairly traumatic anyway um, it's not, you know, you've never gone through anything like that before. It's all new. You're not in control. So all the kind of markers for trauma are right there, aren't they? Um, so it, you, you might want to kind of mentally disconnect from everything below the belly button and not really um, you feel anything there anymore. So becoming more familiar and often palpating the area. So whether that is, you know, actually massaging your belly, massaging your scar, feeling down in the perineum, if you're breathing in and out, just relaxing and feeling if you can feel your breath on your perineum. So perineum is the bit 
at the bottom. So if you put your hand between your legs and you just rest your, your fingers like a whole flat bit of your hand there, can you feel your breathing? So if we want to go back to the relationship with the diaphragm and the pelvic floor, you know, if you've got that as your pelvic floor sitting there and your diaphragm sitting here, as you breathe in, there's pressure coming down onto your organs, which will then push pressure down onto your pelvic floor. That's normal and natural. But because they're connected, as you breathe out, the pelvic floor is going to lift up naturally. So without you even trying to do anything, that's what's going to happen. Or what, that's what should happen naturally. But if you're anxious and you're not breathing into your belly and you're breathing all up here and you high stress, you've got the jaw locked, the psoas muscles, which is in the front of the spine and really connected with fear and might get too esoteric, but again, connected through the pelvic, pelvic space, that's all gonna affect how your pelvic floor connects to your breath or doesn't. So if you've got a tight jaw and you've got, you know you've got tension patterns with your, your um, TMJ or you're breaking tea, or you've got breath all up here, there's never that relationship really going at the pelvic floor, is there? Because the diaphragm isn't really descending, you're never really using it to breathe. You're using all your emergency fight flight muscles to breathe. So that would probably be my first Port of call, and I do this, it's the first thing I observe, observe with a patient when they come in is where are they posture-wise and where are they breathing? Because I can tell you before I've even looked at that pelvic floor exactly what it's going to look like um, mm -hmm. if they've got those tension patterns. You can see so, so much within literally a couple of seconds of, of looking at a woman, how she holds herself, yeah. her posture, what her breathing is like, what her yeah. voice is like. I was just going to say, even if you think to somebody's voice, if they've got this high-pitched kind of breathy, gaspy way of breathing, they're going to have pelvic pain. They're going to have issues with uh, with intercourse because there's not that kind of letting go. They're going to have issues with um, with pain on orgasm or just difficulty actually voiding their bladders properly. Uh, so all these things are going to become um, coming to play. So making sure the face is relaxed and the shoulders are down and you're breathing into your, your diaphragm is going to go a long way to, towards that relationship of the diaphragm dropping on the in-breath and the pelvic floor dropping. So you could do this yourself. Pop your hands between your legs and just feel if you can feel that relationship there. Can you feel an in-breath coming in and can you feel the out-breath going out? And then you can intensify that by really sending the breath into the pelvic floor, a bit like blowing a balloon up between your legs. There's no bearing down, it's just this kind of letting go. And then as you breathe out, doing your contraction. So that could be, I love your analogy of that kind of picking up a handkerchief with the four bony bits. So you've got the, the front to the back and the two bits on the side. Imagine picking up a handkerchief like that um, and drawing it up towards the belly button. That's a great way of just uh, a cue that works for loads of patients. For patients who really can't experience that at all, actually have them put their finger inside the vagina and feel, you know, can you feel, if you pull down on the muscle, can you feel when you try and lift it? Can you feel the other side? Can you feel if it's the same on either side, you know? Um, and for patients who are very uncomfortable with that, just doing it externally, can you feel that it's moving? You know, if you want, work on the breath, work on the jaw, work on um, maybe some meditations, releasing the adductors, because those all um, add into that tension pattern. So, yeah. um, and if you've got a tension pattern, you are going to struggle doing your pelvic floor exercises. And if you're incontinent with a tension pattern, you're going to make it worse very often by doing Kegels. Well, so, this is, the, this I mean, is talking to the, this, quite, this question that, that came in, um, exactly what you're saying um this woman couldn't release after trying to do a kegel she literally just couldn't yeah. let go so what i advised was to go back to um you know lying on her back pelvis up propped up so that the diaphragm is able to push the breath out of her more easily yeah. she's able to go into that parasympathetic nervous system with the extended yeah. exhalation yeah. and really yeah. just focusing on on, on letting the pelvic organs drop away from the pelvic floor and letting the pelvic floor relax yeah. first of all yeah. um because gosh it's yeah. prevalent isn't it the tension it, it is it is and i think post covid i think we're seeing even more of it um and i think um coming on to prolapse a little bit if there is prolapse that particular way of looking at it and doing it can be really helpful because if you've got the organs kind of resting on the pelvic floor more than they should you might find that it's very difficult to get a contraction or to feel a contraction so Taking that tension away by tilting the pelvis and getting, you know, as you say, using gravity to get the organs out of the way, that can be very helpful in, in um, getting a contraction. 
Um, the other thing that you mentioned with the lady who had a rectus seal, is that right? Yes. Um, is, is very often, so if we, if we just define what a rectus seal is, is so if you've got well, my nose through the middle of the vagina. <laughs> Um, so you've got that's the vagina and that's the rectum. So if the rect, so this little sheath of skin here is quite thin and delicate. So if you are prone to constipation or not going to the loo when you need to, which most women do, um, what you tend to do is you make the rectum a storage space, a storage facility. So you can hold on because we've got the luxury of this extra space here. Men don't. So men, when they have to go, they have to go. There's nowhere for anything to go but out. But for us, when we have to go, we can go, oh, no, I can't go right now. And we can store it. And then gradually the, the, the sheath here can become thinner and stretched out. So you end up with a little pouch that sits forward into the vaginal space. Now, if you think where the bladder is sitting, so the rectum is there, and you might have a stool in it, and now you've got the bladder here. Now, the fuller the rectum is, the more storage it's holding, instead of being just a transition facility, the more pressure there is on the bladder. Now, add to that a hypertonic pelvic floor where it's sitting high and tight, the poor bladder has no space, you know, and then you get anxious because you, you're just about to get in the door or, you you know, you feel your bladder's full and you, you're insecure about it. You become even more tense and anxious. There's even less space for the pelvic floor and then you leak. Um, so making sure that the rectum is empty is really important, especially if you have a rectal seal. And I must be honest. In all my years of doing women's health, I see very few women who don't have at least a grade one rectus seal. Yeah. Yeah. And so constipation good. is a problem, isn't it? Especially in perimenopause when we you know, I speak to my 12 year old uh, stepdaughter and, and she's already not going to the loo when she needs to. Ah, she how doesn't interesting. She's going to a friend's house and, you know, I'm asking, obviously, I'm asking these questions, but like you mustn't wait you must go when you need to go and there needs to be a good toileting position because you need those hips um, lower than the knees you know you really want that so what that does if you if you've got your feet up on a stool is you're releasing the muscle here which would normally to kind of block that channel when you're standing so that's a good thing you want that to happen but you don't want that to happen when you're trying to avoid then you want the opposite thing and the way to do that is to bring the knees up so and ladies that's the squatty potty <laughs> so yeah Bring the squatty potty is brilliant i've got them all over the house um and even my my son and my husband are fans of it now and um they thought i was nuts when i got them but now i, I hear those little stools <laughs> i'll tell you what i don't know if there's any women's wellbeing not me members who don't have a uh, a squatty potty or or do something to lift their Ooh. feet up because it's just it's like we're designed to squat to eliminate to talk to yeah. cook da 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 we're not really designed just to sit are we um no and you're fine and i always notice this obviously because of my job but i notice this in coffee shops like Nero's and costas and those they've got these really high seats and you know i just think gosh that's so bad you know mm -hmm. you, what would you do in that situation you know you literally have to squat on the loo <laughs> yeah and yeah i wonder all the loose seats are broken in the public toilet <laughs> All these people climbing onto the toilet seats. <laughs> exactly. Well, good for them. You know, they should design the seats much lower. I find in America, the loo, the loo seats are really, really low. I don't know if you've ever noticed that. They're really Ooh. low. You sit down and you keep going. There's an extra layer. Um, but it, yeah, so I don't know what that's about, but it's quite interesting. So, so to answer the question of the lady with the rectus seal and the tension patterns, you need to release the tension patterns. You need to get the breath right. And you need to go check if you are releasing on the end breath. You know, whether you do that internally, externally, and then she can do a sweep um, with your, your thumb or your finger, just feeling along the back wall of the vagina. I just feel if it's clear, because if there's a lump there, it means you've made, you, you've got a stool sitting in there. It should be clear. And if you've been to the loo and you've voided, it, just check if you get all of it and it's not still some there. And then having a little diary of when you leak, are you leaking later in the day? If you have a bowel movement early in the morning and you, you don't leak until four o'clock in the afternoon, and then suddenly that little run after your toddler, causes a leak where it didn't this morning, it's probably because you've got another stool sitting in there, but you're waiting for tomorrow morning to avoid your bowels again. Now that's interesting, isn't it? So it really needs to be something that right from the beginning of the day, you're hydrating, you're eating in a way that is going to maximize your chance of yeah. going to the toilet. Yeah. And then like you say, if you feel you need a poo, go to the loo. Oh. Go, yeah. don't hold on to it. So just to touch on what you were saying is what do you eat? Um, I'm happy to send my video on Telegram to anybody who wants it on nutrition. 
Um, yeah. You know, 30 grams of soluble, 30 grams of insoluble fiber, that should help with any constipation. And then water, making sure you're sipping through the day, not just gulping a pint every time you think of water. Because if you're not sipping through the day, it's a bit like you're just pouring it through. And especially if you're struggling with incontinence, most women will dehydrate themselves, especially if they know they've got a day out or, you know, they've got to go to the shops. They'll just not drink anything because if there's nothing in the bladder, there's nothing to leak. But of course, that creates a host of other problems. Um, and more often than not, if you then do drink, it does pour straight out of you like a dry pot plant. Whereas if you took that same amount of water and you just tipped it into that plant, you know, every half hour, every hour, it would just be absorbed. You know, your body will use that water much better than when you chuck it in there a pint at a time, because you know you're going to be home for the next few hours and you can go to the loop. I love that analogy. That's that's fantastic. That dry, like say the dry flower bed, if you just pour a whole big ton of water on, it's just going to run off. Yeah. But if little bit by little bit you're hydrating the soil, then the plant is going to prosper. Flourish um, I always get my ladies to to sip it hot water because it's it's you know I say it's like having um, dishwashing liquid and hot water to wash your dishes as opposed to just rinsing under a cold tap. It helps yeah. to sloth through the system and, and helps yeah. everything work better. Yeah, that's so true. Yeah, just to keep everything. Um, Metabic, metabolically working well as well. So I hope that answers the question for the one lady. The other one was the sit to stand. Was that right? She leaking on sitting to standing? Yes. Yeah, okay. there's that question. And then that's there was incredibly common because that's, and we don't think about this, but there's a huge increase in um, intra-abdominal pressure. When I forget who did the studies on this on what increased intra-abdominal pressure. That was one of the things that increases it the most, like shouting at your kids and getting up and sitting to standing. Um, huge amount of increase in the, the pressure that is exerted on the pelvic floor. Could you, know? you just so, explain to everybody, because we say things like intra-abdominal pressure, and I realized yeah, yesterday I'm I was to talking how to, to say that women that, that um, yeah, so yeah, even us saying of, exhale, we need to say breathing out. Breathing um, out, yeah. Yeah, so right. Um, so if we think of the space underneath your ribs, um, right down to you know your bottom of your body, the front of your belly, if you, if you shout at somebody, so if you're just going to have that feeling of shouting, you feel how that tenses and puts pressure through that area. But likewise, when you're coming from sit to stand, it increases the pressure in that same area. So if you've got a tendency, you know, if you've got a urethra that is a little bit open rather than shut fully because maybe lower levels of estrogen while you're breastfeeding, or um, if you've got tension patterns in the pelvis where you can't actually you know, let go and then let the pelvic floor move like it should up and down. It's actually just high and tight or it's just weak and it's just giving way. As you increase the pressure on it, the tendency is to leak in that position. So my advice is normally, first of all, all the other stuff we talked about are the tension patterns, what you're breathing, doing, et cetera, et cetera. But then also breathing out as you get up and connecting with your pelvic floor. So making sure you get that connection to the pelvic floor before you go from sit to stand and breathe out and connect. Um, the other thing that I think is important maybe to note um, is that it's often with, with urinary leakage, it's often the front part of the pelvic floor that's a little bit weaker, um, whereas with, with more um, fecal incontinence, it's be the back. Um, so, so you just want to think that's sort of that area there or this area here. And I see these muscles are all connected. So everything's connected to everything else, unfortunately and fortunately. But I think what's important is to focus the contraction to the front of the pelvic floor. So what I do with my patients is we either add the adductors in to when they are doing their pelvic floor exercises, or they can do something like a bridge with a ball between the legs, using that contraction of the pelvic floor and squeezing the ball as they lift, and really getting that feeling of, um, if you think um, the pelvic floor is lifting from the coccyx to the pubic bone or uh, from the back passage to the front passage, if you feel that lift, really focus on the top of that lift. So if you think of an escalator coming up from the coccyx all the way right up to level 10 by the pubic bone, at the top of that um, escalator, imagine a double door shutting. So almost like you're shutting the labia. So that when you're doing your pelvic floor exercises, you're really focusing on the anterior part of it. And of course you can do that sitting, standing, lying, um, where you've really focused that attention to the front or you use a ball or a towel or a pillow or something between your legs when you do it, just so you're adding in that extra layer of help um, mm. to contract through the front part of the pelvic floor. Breathing out as you contract 
um, and breathing in and making sure you're completely relaxing to the bottom. Because the pointless doing an exercise where you're just going from, um, you know, four, if, it, if it's from zero to 10 and you're only going from five to 10 all the time, that's pointless. You're not going to strengthen your muscle. You need to go all the way from zero all the way to 10 to get the, the full contraction. And the other thing is when you're doing your fast contractions, we you imagine you're kind of dropping a little ping pong ball and catching it, make sure to drop the ball because as you said with the lady before, if you're not letting go, the pelvic floor does this. So that's very classic in patients with hypertonus because they drop and catch, drop and catch, drop and catch, and eventually they bend. And they go, I can't get a contraction anymore because there's nowhere to go. But if you were doing drop and catch, drop and catch, drop and catch there, you'd feel that, but you could feel all of that externally easily. So, you know, if you get squeamish and you don't want to do internal feeling, although I highly encourage that you do, um, that's just that feeling of, are you dropping or you just catch, 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 catch? Oh, Which I love that analogy of dropping the ping pong ball. That's a great one because, um, like you say, uh, sometimes we're not, you know, the, the breathing side of things as well as the contraction and releasing side of things can be a little bit discombobulating a bit hard to coordinate but if yeah. you've got a visualization of you know you're picking up the ping pong ball you're dropping it and it's like that um you know the speed of a game of ping pong for yeah. those fast twitch muscles yeah it has to I be like that. Like, i don't bother with the breath on those if i'm honest with you because it sure. is too much for most people and i don't think you really need your diaphragm involved there you know yep. if you just and, and this is this is where, you know, that quick little, oh, my child's about to run across the road, quick three little steps, boom, 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 you know, um, public floor needs to be able to do that. Uh, yeah. So that's quite important. Where I would encourage it for kind of single leg work is in a bridge, um, halfway up and doing marches in the bridge and using that puffy breath there, because yes. that's kind of encouraging that weight bearing, especially for my runners, you know, where they're leaking when they're running. So we're yep. offloading the pelvic floor by tilting the pelvis so in a bridge, and they've got that, doof, 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 but at the speed they'd run or walk. And for the pelvic so floor. You're keeping the diaphragm high and therefore yes. keeping the pelvic floor high, yeah. activating the deep core muscles as well when you're doing that, aren't you? Yes. So, yeah, no, that's, that's yeah. great. So you've got the breath. Yeah. And then you've got your, ah, your relaxation. Exactly. And, breath. and then your slower ones would be your slow kind of squeeze and lift and draw squeeze and lift and drop on the in breath um, but always making sure to drop because honestly uh, Linda I see more hypertonicity than I've Dang. ever seen I keep saying to everyone now please come to my Monday night class I, I just uh, honestly it's like the amount of tension you know mental tension overwhelm complete stress in life and of course that is <laughs> reflected in lower back pain hip pain yeah. pelvic floor dysfunction i'm like please just come to you know move into stillness i think so many people yeah. find they can't just meditate because they're too busy so move Rest and breathe you. slowly yeah. get yourself slowly unwinding into a state where you your pelvic floor has got a chance just to go Ah, <laughs> yeah, that is that's so important. But also every day, you know, it's one thing to do it on a Monday night, but also every day. I, I must just leave you with a little nugget that I got this morning from Brené Brown's new book, The Atlas of the Heart, and she talks a lot about emotions and naming them and knowing what they are and you know how to respond to them. But the analogy she used about overwhelm and anxiety, um, you know, when you're just stressed and anxious or when you're in overwhelm, what's the difference? And she said she worked in a restaurant that was like a high stress environment and it was go, go, go all the time. So that kind of, and um, they had two words that they used with each other in order to explain where they were at. And they'd say, I'm in the weeds. And that meant I'm really stressed right now. I need some help. And one of the other servers would say, okay, I'll take that table for you. I'll do the bread for that table. I'll quickly take the water to that table. And people would come in and help. So you were drawing people to you. But if you came in and you said, I'm blown, they would take your whole load. Nobody would ask for anything and you'd have 10 minutes to just go and decompress. And that's oh, overwhelming. Like oh, we love um, Renee, don't we? I know. And you know what really gave me goosebumps? She says, in that 10 minutes, nobody asked you how you felt. Nobody asked you what you were going to do about it. You just did nothing. You did nothing. You could go and cry if you needed to. You could go into the fridge, you could go outside. Nobody expected you to even ask you which tables you were serving. They knew you were blown. You were gone. And I think we just need to recognize that as well in ourselves, you know, the difference between overwhelm and anxiety stress, but also that, that recognition that if you're in overwhelm, the only thing you can do about it is do nothing. Mm. 
you know, for a period of time, just go into stillness. And we had this conversation on Monday, just stop. <laughs> just stop. And sometimes I think women need permission, especially midlife women need permission uh, to stop from people who are able to say, if you don't, if you don't stop and you keep on adding more things, well, it's that, because, because you're in that, you know, busyness equals worthiness yeah. societal cycle, then yeah. sadly it's, you know, not only you, but everyone's going to suffer. It's, it's yeah. yeah. Yeah, hard, hard, but necessary. <laughs> yeah, this is the work. It's the work. Yeah. Any any um thing else you want to add before we wrap up? There's no other um, questions that I can see that have come in. I, I think just if we if we're on the topic of incontinence, we've spoken about this before. You know, what is it? Eighty percent of women in nursing homes are there because of incontinence. Yep. Um, most women stop exercising when they're incontinent to some degree. You know. Yeah. Um, and we look at the impact that it has on cardiovascular disease and cancer and um, osteoporosis and all those things. And it's not, it's not a little thing. It has a massive impact. It has mm. a massive impact. So leaking a little bit is not okay. It, it, you can sort it out. It really isn't hard to treat, you know? Mm. Um, I just mm. really want to, I want to beg women to get some help because I'm just like, if you could take, if you could take the view I've got looking at the bigger picture, of what happens to women later on it's so heartbreaking and you think this could have been sorted much much easier you know? same so, i totally yeah, agree wait. Yeah. don't worry yeah health really is our wealth you know i just keep i i want to say to everybody it doesn't matter how big your pension plan is it doesn't matter what grade your kids got at school because you were so on their exam technique etc it doesn't matter how perfect your house looks if you get to 60 70 even 80 and you haven't looked after your pelvic health you haven't prioritized your mental well-being um sadly it's 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 not going to end well so i you know it's an investment yeah. and it's an investment yeah, now it's absolutely an investment them. absolutely right linda my patients are right so i've got a skedaddle but it's nice been to see you thank you for you. joining us and Take any care. other questions do let me know and i'll let you i'll give you some answers when i can when i next see you. next time next time excellent yeah. Thank you for your Bye time. Bye. Bye.